Larry Krasner, I want to ask you about the people still locked up in Philadelphia's jails, despite the higher risk of contracting COVID. Uh, most of them are waiting for their day in court, which has been disrupted due to the spread of the virus. Many are bail eligible. The Philadelphia Community Bail Fund has been actively bailing people out during this time. Some activists have focused in particular on young people who are still imprisoned. This is a member of the Youth Art and Self-Empowerment Project named Brianna, describing what it was like when her juvenile son was recently incarcerated during COVID. I worried. I worried about my son. Is he eating? Is he safe? Is he cold? I also couldn't see my son because of COVID-19, which made it even worse. So it was 14 days that I only had a phone conversation with my son. There were no hugs. There were no kisses. Uh, D.A. Larry Krasner, do you think there are people locked up right now who should not be given the health risks? What is your office doing to release more people um, from what have been called death traps? I'm looking at an ad by the Philadelphia Community Bail Fund. They said, D.A. Larry Krasner, drop the charges, not your knee. They said, charge more than 400 people in the last two days of protests. This was in the last weeks. Kept over 100 black youth in detention during COVID, incarcerated thousands of black Philadelphians in cages at risk of death during COVID. Can you respond to these um, accusations or criticisms against you? Well, you know, the, the problem with a lot of these criticisms is they're completely out of context and, frankly, cynically out of context. The, when we came into office, we were coming off of a city that had 10,000 people in county custody. We started with 6,500. We knocked it down to about 5,000 within a year and a half, which was the quickest progress towards decarceration, essentially, in the, the history of the city. And we are currently at 4,000. This is the lowest rate of incarceration in Philadelphia since the uh, about 1985, 1985. Um, and we have gotten there through a lot of extremely diligent and careful work. But you know, I would be misleading you if I told you I thought that people who were accused of murdering four people should be out of custody. They should not. They should be in custody before they kill five people. And I'm not making that up. We have someone sitting there who literally was a contract killer and who uh, is associated with four different murders. We have someone else associated with five. Once again, you know, let's talk about the juveniles. When we came in, there were about 650 juveniles in custody, which was lower than it had been in the past. There's now on the, it changes every day, of course, uh, but there's now something like 140. It is not enough simply to say that someone is a juvenile. If that juvenile has paralyzed another juvenile by shooting him in the back of the head behind a dumpster, there is a role that has to be played by the state in order to make sure that we do not have the slaughter of people on the street. So I, I do not have any reservation about saying that there are some people who need to be in custody even under these circumstances. But this office, working closely with the Public Defender's Office, has done a remarkable job of uh, diminishing the harm that could have come from Philadelphia's jails becoming a, an epicenter. They have not become that. We have experienced, uh, based on my limited information, we've experienced a total of two deaths among the inmate population, I believe two deaths among the staff population. But as we compare that to national averages, a lot of the extremely hard work that we have done and that we're continuing to do has paid off. It's a real problem. I mean, I'm not going to kid you. It's a real problem in a city where ordinarily you have 100 new criminal cases a day that there's no easy exit door to the jail because the courts are closed and they've been closed for months and it does not look like they're going to open up quickly. But all, all things considered, when we are objective and fair about it, I think we've actually done an excellent job of keeping this population down, of being very surgical about which individuals need to be in custody at this time. I also think it is fair to say that, um, and I, I'm not going to get specific with which bail fund, but there's, you know, there's one of these bail funds that took a young man who had no prior record and was racking up one drug case after another in a very short period of time in a way that anyone experienced in criminal justice would say signifies that this person needs to be held in custody needs an intervention. But once again, the bail fund, uh, you know, went charging in, paid that person's bail. He came out and was killed on a corner shortly thereafter. He was on the corner because the bail fund, even though this young man, who was only 18 and a half, when it started, had collected six consecutive drug cases in a very short period of time. They ran. 
and paid his bail and got him out the last time. We've seen another case. It was a domestic violence case where the defendant had uh, viciously harmed his long-term partner in a number of different states, been convicted for it, and over the objection of the DA's office, uh, who were trying to protect her, bail fund looked at none of that, ran and paid it, and she then suffered a terrible sexual assault at the hands of the same person. So it is not the case that every single person should get out all of the time. It is not the case that simply saying no matter what the offense, no matter what the record, no matter what the circumstances, everyone should get out. The life of that woman mattered. The life of that young man whose bail was paid and died mattered. It all matters. And we have to be careful about these things. Um, before we go, I wanted to ask you about Mumia Abu-Jamal, one of the most recognized cases in Philadelphia history. One of the least known facts of the case is that Mumia was nearly beaten to death at the crime scene. Within weeks of the end of the trial, a third of the police involved in this case were jailed for systematically tampering with evidence to obtain convictions in cases across Philadelphia. At least one police officer in the case, James Forbes, lied on the stand, saying he'd properly handled guns. What are the recourses for addressing police corruption, both in Mumia Abu-Jamal's case and that of so many others in which police were jailed for wrongdoing, but the victims remained in jail? Some say Philadelphia has a history of cases like this. I asked you about Mumia Abu-Jamal when you were running for DA. You're now in for three years. What's happening in his case? So, in terms of the broader question about corruption, one of the things that my office has done is we've established a police misconduct database. You might call it a list, but it's really a lot better than that, in which we have, consistent with our constitutional obligation to give the defense all the information they're entitled to, including information that may be used by the defense to try to defeat our case as prosecutors. What happens is we keep data, we keep information, whether it is findings by police of lying or brutality, or it's a police officer having been charged with a crime in a different county, or it may even be a judge having made a decision that a particular police officer lied, or it could be, you know, postings on Facebook that show bias uh, towards any particular group. We keep all of that information, and because it's a database, as soon as a new case comes into the system involving that officer, the information automatically uh, is is connected to the case and is then appropriately provided to the defense. That's never been done in Philadelphia before. It is a relatively high tech and we think kind of excellent solution. And it's also fair to the police because they are notified that they're on this database. They're given the opportunity to come in and explain why it may be biased. And the truth is sometimes it is because internal affairs is as political and as biased as anything else at certain times in certain cases. So that, you know, that's part of what we've done. We have exonerated at this point 14 people, and we've been in office for about 26 months. It is a sea change from everything that, that came before. Uh, and included on our police misconduct database, there are certain individuals who are categorized as ordinarily people we will not call. We will not call to testify because we do not trust their integrity. There are other people who are in a less difficult situation. As for Mumia Abu Jamal, that is in about the 40th year of its litigation. We have some uh, things going on very actively in that case. We take that case uh, no more and no less seriously than every other case because of the notoriety about it. One of the things that I've certain, certainly seen in our work around exoneration and conviction integrity is I have seen that often the unfamous people get a whole lot less attention than the famous people. But what I can say in that regard is it is pending. There are certain restrictions on what we should appropriately say at this time. Uh, but it does, you know, it, it is a microcosm of the realities of what progressive prosecutors face now when they're trying to go back in time and do justice, when they're trying to do justice moving forward, when they're trying to comply with their obligations to give exculpatory information in a culture that used to shred and used to hide and used to destroy a culture that I experienced for almost 30 years as a criminal defense and civil rights attorney.